a little bit of background. So I started uh, at Rutgers in June of 2021. Uh, I've lived in New Jersey for quite some time, but I was at Penn first. So I was in Philadelphia doing my research there. And then I was at NYU for a year. So part of the reason why I wanted to have this salon together us together is because I'm not having lived in New Jersey for a while I'm not as familiar uh, mm. with the sort of communities especially those serving older adults in the state of New Jersey um, and so this project was developed by me during the pandemic I wrote it it surprisingly got funded on the first try uh, and so now we're in year two of, of um, this project um, so my prior um, background is actually music. I'm a musician. I play piano. Um, and I went into nursing as a second degree. And so I was uh, and always wanted to work with older adults, uh, especially those who have cognitive impairment. Um, and so this project, that's how it was born. Uh, next slide. So the, the purpose um, of the sort of the overall objective of this research of this five-year research project is to really improve sleep and other behavioral symptoms in, in individuals living with uh, dementia um, as well as their caregivers using music-based approaches. So uh, when I was a postdoc, I developed um, a music application, a music um, intervention I sort of you know tested it out or uh, with individuals and they gave me a lot of feedback in terms of what worked and what didn't work for them but in, and so I kind of switched my approach for this study and instead of just giving folks what I think is going to work I instead want to ask them first what they think is going to work um, and then um, uh, give it to them to see if it works uh, and so hence the, the aims are one to build and sort of co-design and refine the, the prototype of the um, mobile app. And I for short called it Composer um, it, for, for use among individuals living with dementia and their caregivers. Next slide. Um, so there, of course, there are several uh, research questions, but here I want to provide you questions from our focus groups or design workshops, our interviews, we originally wanted to do um, uh, focus groups with individuals living with dementia and their care partners, as well as other healthcare professionals. However, because we had to pivot, um, you know, I wrote this in the middle of the pandemic, but at that point, the NIH still, um, you know, wanted for me to submit stuff as is, as if the pandemic was not existing. Uh, and so we had to pivot to virtual focus groups. And what we realized quite quickly is that um, to do a focus group with several individuals who have cognitive impairment as well as their caregivers was quite challenging to do. So we pivoted instead and got the IRB approval to instead hold individual interviews um, with uh, as part of this design workshops. And right now we're almost done. I think we have uh, one more um, diet to recruit. Um, but in that first round of, of this interviews, we're, we're asking the following questions. And there's of course sub questions and additional questions that we ask, but essentially we wanna get a sense of you know, um, you know, we asked them about questions about their sleep, like sleeping, bedtime routine. We also asked them about what role does music play in their life? Um, and we'll kind of probe them in terms of, you know, would they use something like a mobile app? Um, uh, and, you know, what kind of features should it have? And, you know, essentially we were, I'm, I, I wrote this for it to be sort of an open forum. So let's say if all the participants tell me that, Maybe it's not the mobile app that we'll need. Maybe we need something else. I want it to be open enough that we've got to co-design together and um, you know, so that the intervention actually is of use as to as many individuals as possible. And also the greatest, and we we try to very hard to get diversity in our participants. So not just the caregiver relationship as well as racial uh, diversity as well. And so, and then the second round of, uh, of interviews, so what we're planning to do is after we finish data collection, we're gonna look at um, sort of what the data say and then come back to the same individuals in the second round of workshops with a, some sort of a prototype or some sort of image or um, 
of what we think, what, what, you know, what we got from the first round and say, okay, now that you actually have some, some visual in front of you, what do you think and will you use it and such? So, so that's sort of the, the first uh, stage of the, uh, the big, bigger stage of the process. Uh, I think next slide. Um, so for to be included um, in this workshop, I tried to keep the inclusion criteria as um, as open as sort of as broad as possible, uh, because obviously when I conduct a clinical trial later on, the criteria becomes more specific and will exclude more individuals. But for for this part of the study, you know, they have to be over the age of 60. They have to be living in their own home, so they cannot be living in an institutional care setting. Um, in terms of the caregiver, they can uh, they also have to have a diagnosis of dementia, either self-report or um, a physician, or we get it from the medical records. Um, in terms of the caregiver, um, they have to be over the age of 18, and if they're a member of the healthcare team, they have to be sort of directly delivering services to um, somebody living with dementia, such as a home care nurse. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the formal caregivers, we do restrict those um, who are able to communicate to us in English because uh, obviously I do not um, speak um, other languages and so our staff does not as well. So we did, our interviews are conducted in English. Um, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, um, here we uh, talk about sort of the focus groups and the interviews that they're being conducted over Zoom. Um, and then um, what I originally wrote out in the grant is that I will form, there will be a sort of a design team or community advisory board. I, I called it design team, but I think essentially it serves the same purpose. Um, that will be uh, consist of individuals living with dementia and, their, um, and caregivers. And that design team will meet regularly throughout the course of the project to help me, um, like look or you know, um, look over the study findings. So help me direct me in a different direction or help me guide through you know through the process. Uh, and that is the part that I'm still a bit struggling with, and I would love your help on that. I did reach out to my previous research participants um, in the sort of. Uh, surrounding area near Philadelphia. And I had a couple who were interested. And so I'm trying to figure out how, what's the best practices of growing um, this group and actually having them meet regularly. Um, and then in terms of their recruitment, we started, I knew that coming into Rutgers recruitment of older adults will present a, a challenge. Uh, and so I kind of started um, uh, at a place where I thought I would get sort of most, uh, not response, but most positive response. And this was to work with uh, uh, geriatricians um, at Rutgers, as well as um, uh, behavioral neurologist, Dr. William Hu from the School of Medicine. And so right now we're, we started our recruitment in two primary care um, clinics. Um, so one in, in Monroe uh, with Dr. Fred Cabalars, and the second one is with Dr. William who and his specifically his nurse practitioner um, they both have been fantastic to work with um, and then Sophia is there in person uh, one or two days a week and then uh, we knew obviously because of the slower patient flow and how many patients are seen in those clinics we knew that it wasn't going to be enough so at the same time I started building partnerships with um, the Alzheimer's Association the great Greater New Jersey chapter, so I'm their community educator, and we also started. We also reached out, you know, looked at NJ Axe and all the resources that they're there, and so we um, we got an approval to run the Deep Six AI cohort builder, um, and so we also started thinking about how can we recruit over Facebook um, and a Research Match. So kind of use the resources that are already there that we have access to, but also think about at the same time, how to reach out to the community um, as well. Next slide. Um, I have a question more... um, for the individual that's diagnosed. It does it matter what stage they are in their journey of dementia? Um, so in terms of for this project, um, yes. So they cannot be um, like in the late stages of dementia um, because they would have to we ask questions about like how would they use the mobile app, um, but 
we don't have, um, I think we have some cutoff points, but we are, most individuals who live sort of in the community in the home tend to be a sort of mild, moderate stages, which is kind of who we're targeting. Okay, thank you. But we really get that sense when like Sophia talks to the individual because that sometimes, um, you know, like a cutoff score on a mini mental status or some sort of, um, you know, cognitive assessment sometimes does not correlate with it, you know, how an individual is able to understand the research project and actually use, you know, technology. Yeah, um, I, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have, you've been conducting uh, the research in two clinics, mm -hmm. the primary care clinics, and uh, um, have you been asking the doctors to refer patients to you? Yes, exactly. So that's, um, that was sort of how we started. However, quickly realizing and having worked um, as a nurse, I, I wanted to kind of to make this as um, less time consuming as possible because of how busy our clinicians are. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we the process that we have approved from the IRB is that the yes, the physician would share, like would mention the study um, to the participant and kind of gauge their interest. And then we take it from there. So it is up to us to then contact the individual or send them a letter, um, call them. Uh, but we sort of, uh, at least that's my approach is to try to make it as less time consuming. So I don't require the physician to kind of go over the study and the, all of that, it just helps share the information, pass our information along. Right, I'm it sorry. It becomes I... daunting the amount of work, but if you think about it as a portfolio of work and relationships that you're trying to build so that you'll have other people to work with as new projects come along, then it, it it's sort of a mindset switch that makes it helpful. So for example, I started working with a group about 20 years ago who they were doing outreach around breast cancer survivorship. I was interested in trying to look at follow-up care. And so there were some moments where my research at, dovetailed with them and other moments where it was not always synergistic, but thinking about are there opportunities to do things around training? And, and so I don't know if you have like students or other things, but like thinking about sort of from the, the organization or another person's perspective, what else can they get out of the relationship besides our publications and the other pieces? And so sometimes it's a lot of work, but oftentimes it can be very small things like, here's what we're planning to do with this when we get done. So this study is a stepping stone to the next phase and sharing that broader vision so that they sort of see, okay, we've got this app that's coming through. Like, are we planning to actually try to move it out and maybe partner with the Alzheimer's Association or do an i kind of thing where you figure out, well, what's the next step? We're gonna try to get this on the app store. So like people then say, okay, this isn't like a one and done. There's like something that's gonna happen with it later on. And that there's some, there's some commitment to seeing that move forward. And we realize that like, things may happen and it may not get there, but being able to share the vision of, okay, here's why we're doing this and here's how the stepping stone, I think helps to create the story and the narrative so that people then go, oh, I get why we would do this as opposed to mm -hmm. we're making a widget and then we're gonna go write a paper on a widget and nobody's ever gonna use the widget again. So, mm -hmm. so that's, so, it, so partly it's the, there's also the storytelling component to it that I think is important with building relationships because people want to see that there's, it's bi-directional, that they're getting something out of it too. And sometimes the getting something out of it is, it's very much in line with the research and other times you may have to think a little more creatively around mm -hmm. like what that relationship looks like mm -hmm. in cultivating I want to echo what Shauna. I said. just want to comment on the uh, reaching out uh, to the senior group is very different from reaching out to the general public um, in terms of um, the way uh, transportation is an issue because a lot of them are homebound. 
-hmm. And then, so how do you, how do you actually reach, reach out to them? And also a lot of the senior citizens um, take New Jersey as an example. Um, the population is very diverse and a lot of them are immigrants. And so there are, there are language issues. Mm -hmm. And also maybe they're, they have hearing problems. Mm -hmm. So, so that all these are considerations. I just want to make some comments for your, your reference. Mm -hmm. I guess I could echo with that, you know, with the senior center, you'll see a different person. You'll see a different personality in the same person. Um, possibly in, in, in a week or in a day. Um, I have seniors, they actually come into our center and you know, they present one way and the next day they come in, it's like, why am I here? Who am I here? And we're primarily a recreational center. So if they, ha if they have mostly the self-diagnosed um, dementia or beginning stages of dementia, you know, of course we let them come in because we believe that the communication um, and the, the cooperative environment helps them out a lot. But I do see different personalities that present themselves. Um, so if you interviewed one today, and if you can interview the exact same person in a week's time, and they will present totally as someone different and not even knowing who you are, um, because however it progresses, that, that becomes an issue. So um, in doing the research and doing the interviews, I would just be, really be concerned about that. I guess that's an answer that no one really have at this point. Um, it's something that can, you know, we can, again, present one day and the next day something different. Um, I know we do use music in our center. Um, it's, it's and different types of music. It drowns the individuals sometimes and it annoys some of the individuals because of the volume that's, that becomes a problem. So it's trying to six of one, a half of those and the other. We just try to find a good mix for, for those that it may, annoy, we can we just redirect them into a different room or different activity. And sometimes they'll find themselves right back to what annoyed them and they're enjoying it. So it is a very difficult and very sensitive um, situation. We just have to you know, handle it as such, as is sensitive and personal to the individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last final comments?